Got a full house here, just to describe it to you. This is one of the first we've had since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, wish you could be here with us in the flesh. Happy to see you there online, of course. A real pleasure. So as is customary before each event, uh, I'd like to remind everyone we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I would like to take this moment to offer respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. My name is Peter Maravellis. I'm the events director here at City Lights and City Lights in conjunction with Deep Vellum Books and our friends at the Romanian Cultural Institute are delighted and honored to have Mircea Catarescu with us here tonight in conversation with Mario Javier Cardenas. So, you know, needless to say, this is a very auspicious moment. Uh, Mircea Cadarascu is a Romanian novelist, poet, short story writer, literary critic, and essayist. He has published more than 25 books. His work has received the Form Enterprise, the Thomas Mann Prize, the Austrian State Prize for Literature, amongst many others. His work has been translated into 23 languages. Uh, his novels include Blinding, which is published by Archipelago Books, Nostalgia, which is published by New Directions, and Solenoid, published by Deep Vellum, which is the most recent translation. Mr. Catarasco is a professor in the Department of Literary Studies at the University of Bucharest. Mr. Catarasco produces deeply absorbing fiction that stretches the ontological possibilities of writing. His work explores the minutia of the human condition, oftentimes with a mind-bending effect. Now, translating work into any language can be a very perilous affair. And we know this because City Lights, you know, from this inception has been very interested in literature and translation. Aside from the beat generation, this is part of what we do. So uh, I think that the translations of Sean Cotter and Julian Similian of Mr. Kaderascu's work are able to really capture an aura. And really, despite the difficulty and impossibility and many times, of the task at hand when it comes to translation. They are able to honestly portray between words and through words, the many layers of Mr. Kaderascu's imagination. And I really can attest through my response as a reader and a witness, it's affirmative, it's wonderstruck. And I have to say, I've been very emotionally engaged. So this would not be possible without a deep commitment by both translator and author to their craft. And Murtia Kaderascu is precisely such a writer, someone who takes their craft seriously, challenging his own limits and thinking about what truly matters in life and in writing. So joining him tonight, as mentioned, is Mauro Javier Cardenas. He is no stranger to City Lights. We have featured him many times before. Really very honored and happy to have him with us. He's the author of Aphasia and also The Revolutionaries Try Again. Uh, in 2016, he received a Joseph Henry Jackson Award. And in 2017, the Hay Festival included him in the Bogota 39 selection of best young Latin American novelist. His interviews and essays about and with such writers as Laszlo Krasnokorkai, Antonio Lobo Antunes, Javier Mareas, Horacio Castellones Moya, amongst others, have appeared in music and literature, the San Francisco Chronicle, Bomb Magazine, Zizova, and many, many others. So, after this evening's conversation, we will be making some time for Mr. Kadarascu to sign books. Um, for those of you online, we have posted links in the chat of your Zoom dashboard with which you may also purchase books. Uh, there will also be time for Q&A. Um, so please join us now in giving a warm welcome to Machia Kadarascu and Mauro Javier Cadenas. Gentlemen, welcome to City Lights. So uh, we were we had a chance to connect uh, a few minutes before uh, the event, uh, and you told me that I could ask you anything. Uh, and I didn't prepare that question, but I was I was uh, I wanted to ask you, but I didn't write it down. But now that you gave me permission, whether or not you dreamt last night and wrote down the dream that you had last night. Um. It's, um, in my opinion, it's the best question to start our conversation because uh, many times the critics call my work uh, an oneric one. Uh, well, unfortunately, I did not dream anything last night. Uh, and um, I think that uh, this art of dreaming left me some quite many years ago. Um, I'm a really... <sighs> 
I'm really uh, very much disappointed with my mind, um, which um, after I was 60, um, I don't know if that matters or not, but um, it um, got lazy by nights. Um, I used to dream so much and uh, so uh, wonderfully, wonderfully colored all the qualia of uh, our uh, of our uh, um, human experience were ten times ten times uh, um, more powerful in my dreams. I think that I inherited this power of dreaming from my mother. Uh, my mother was the biggest dreamer that maybe ever existed, or uh, um, the biggest dreamer that I know. Uh, anyway, uh, she was a woman from the countryside, and uh, she had no um, um, education, let's say uh, she had only four classes, but uh, each and every morning, she used to retell us, me and my sister, a dream. And those dreams were not dreamed by uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. They couldn't have been dreamed by, uh, by um, Bolaño, which uh, we talked about, we just talked about. There were uh, beyond them, beyond literature and beyond imagination, um, cruel, um, um, wonderful, uh, full of uh, levitation, full of uh, 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 demonic characters, uh, full of uh, images from her uh, uh, life uh, in the village where she was born, uh, images like in Chagall with uh, cows floating on the skies and um, um, I don't know, uh, um, uh, pubs, pubs uh, um, uh, painted green or painting uh, indigo or things like that, full of colors, full of uh, miracle. Uh, and um, I always ad admired her for this, for her nocturnal life. And uh, what uh, I uh, praise more, most in my life uh, was also the power of dreaming, of having real dreams, nocturnal dreams. Um, I, uh, um, am, I, I do not consider myself mainly an author of books, of novels or of short stories of, of poetry. I'm uh, fundamentally uh, an author of a um, journal. Um, um, the journal is my most important book ever. I started to, um, to write it since I was 17. So in, uh, on uh, the 15th of September this year, my journal will be 50. Uh, <laughs> and each and every, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm very proud of it. Um, and each and every dream I had during those, that, that half of a century are noted down in this journal. I have maybe 700, 800 of dreams noted down in this, uh, in this journal. And I think they are the best part of my uh, uh, work because it's, it doesn't belong to me, but they belong to my deeper mind, my deeper mind, the, the depths of, uh, of, my, uh, uh, of my being in a way. And uh, everything I wrote uh, was inspired from my dreams. I wrote uh, some, of, some, some of my short stories are actually real dreams that I had. Um, in uh, Solenoid, I have uh, about 40 dreams put down, right, uh, written down and explained in, in a kind of pseudo Freudian way. All of them were really dreamed by, by not by me, but by my mind. And uh, uh, now you can understand how sad I am that I didn't have a, 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 an interesting dream. Well, I dream sometimes, but like any other person, you know, some fragments of uh, um, yesterday, the day before yesterday, and so on, so, uh, such, uh, a, a kind of a I don't know how to call them, uh, um, not important, not uh, fundamental, not uh, archetypal dreams, usual dreams, which I despise actually. 
So I hope, I can only hope that my mind wakes up uh, at a certain moment and realizes that uh, it, I'm feeding it for nothing. <laughs> well, I, you know, a few, a uh, few years ago, I noticed that in my first two novels, there were no dreams whatsoever. So I started asking myself, why are there no dreams in my books? And I came up with, with two reasons. One of them is that I had learned or had digested the idea that was handed down to me that dreams in fiction are you know, frown upon because fiction is already a dream and to include a dream within a dream. And, uh, you know, and not only that, but most, most of us believe that we are experts in interpreting dreams. And so dreams become too interpretable and then they become too, uh, if something's too interpretable, then it's, you know, against the possibilities of fiction. So that was one, one sort of, I, I, I noticed that I internalized that idea. And then the other one in the general culture and American culture in general, I noticed is there's uh, there was a, a comedy skit on TV uh, where it was about you could uh, call this company. Uh, it was called this company was called Listen Up, and you can call it to uh, to tell it your most boring activities throughout the day for a hundred thousand dollars a month. You can call these numbers, but we will not listen to your dreams. Right. This idea of, of, you know, and so, you know, I realized that I, there's so little uh, dream dreams in American fiction and contemporary American fiction, perhaps for some of these reasons, because there's this notion that dreams, uh, you know, are too interpretable. And yet what's wonderful about dreams in Solenoid, the Fourier dreams, is that for the majority of them, you can't read them and be like, okay, I know exactly what this means from a Freudian perspective, or this is about, you know, his mother or, or, or some, like you were saying, some of these dreams that you detest, but the dreams themselves seem to exist in their own. Like this, here is a dream world. And I found myself having to, to imagine them. I had to spend a lot of time to imagine them because I was recreating something so deep, so personal, you know? So, so I think that, it, it it was it was very impressive to say so many dreams in your book and and working so beautifully with the rest of it. You know, you are absolutely right. Um, actually, uh, each and every writer knows it that uh, any time you put a dream in your uh, writing, you lose a reader. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a it's a sort of an equation, uh, but this is uh, true only when you try to do them uh, um, mot a mot, let's say. Uh, if you do not think that everything that you do is actually dreamlike, um, of course you, you won't be uh, successful uh, by inserting um, uh, um, usual dreams that you dreamed uh, the, the night before. But let us think of real um, creators of uh, a dreaming lit a dreamlike literature like Franz Kafka for example he is the most important he's the fundamental uh, example that I can give uh, whose whole work is actually built uh, at the caliber of the dream um, Let's let's take his uh, two big novels, uh, the pro the the trial and uh, the castle. They are huge dreams, but not the dreams that he had. Maybe he had some uh, core of of of, of uh, those uh, big uh, literary dreams, but they are made um, similar to dreams in a, in a um, in a creative process similar to what our brain um, genuinely creates uh, when, when we dream, when we have significant dreams, because there are all kinds of dreams. Um, the, the, the old people um, in Rome or in Greece or in other older cultures could, could, uh, could uh, um, um, uh, describe several levels of uh, what they called dreams. And um, there was only one uh, which was shining like a diamond. They, they called it Orama, 
and uh, they considered they were sent by gods and they were archetypal dreams. They were um, dreams more real than what we call reality because uh, the, the concept of reality itself uh, is made by, by our dreams. Um, if we didn't dream, we wouldn't know that uh, um, reality wasn't what we see and what we get. Um, so um, um, the, the castle of Kafka is a real novel. It has characters, it has an action, it has a, well, a, a whole world uh, that it's described minutely and with much realism, but actually you cannot understand it rationally. You can see that it's poetry there. It's dreaming there. It's, uh, I, I don't know, uh, uh, it's magic there. It's a, a, another kind of, of, uh, of uh, um, thinking and another kind of writing. It's not like uh, those, uh, um, uh, those uh, um, uh, words in between the bardo states as, uh, as uh, the mystics called, called them. So um, uh, those, uh, um, those states of enchantment or uh, of uh, um, dreaming, dreaming with uh, eyes open that uh, we experience from time to time. Uh, everything that Kafka did, so the, the way Kafka understood literature was in this, uh, in this way. Um, he was only a portal. He, uh, his uh, real personality didn't matter. He actually let everything pass through him, pass through this portal and become pure literature. So uh, in this way, uh, um, the, the oniric literature is legitimate. In some other ways, when you retell what you dreamed the last night, it's not, and it's very boring uh, <laughs> usually. So this is uh, the difference, difference in my opinion. When I, uh, when I first read, the first time I read uh, Solenoid uh, in Spanish translation, I was very struck by, and I like to believe, influenced by some of the ideas that the narrator shares. One of them being that when he talks about, I'm gonna write about my anomalies. And he talks about, I can make no distinction between an ancient memory, a dream, a hallucination, reality. It all happens from the same place. And although your, your novel has been called the great surrealist novel, like I've started wondering, that's perhaps surrealism is not really the right way to describe it because it feels to me that what you're doing is simply saying there is so much more to reality than what happens in front. All of it is processed by the same organ, which is your mind. And so there's an equality, you know, where everything's treated with us as if we're coming from the same place, which it is. Uh, yes. Uh, 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 we should remember now that the real romantics, the German romantics uh, at the beginning of the 19th century made a very meaningful uh, distinction between imagination and fantasy. Well, in my opinion, the surrealists uh, are on the, the imagination side. So uh, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, um, well, uh, um, reshape uh, some, re re replace some uh, uh, fragments of reality, making sort of uh, so sort of imaginary animals uh, from the medieval bestiaries and so on. So they take the head of a um, uh, of a lion and the body of a, of a of a mule and so on, and they make something that looks uh, very strange, very, very uh, unusual. But this is not the way uh, of uh, making good literature. Uh, this is uh, Archimboldo's way of, uh, of painting. But uh, Juan Miró or other, or Giorgio de Chirico uh, wouldn't agree with it. They are on the other side of, uh, of uh, making things that uh, you cannot find in uh, I, I uh, come back again uh, with my with my uh, uh, um, sentence uh, what we think is is reality what what we call reality and we should 
maybe we should talk a bit about, about it because I'm really obsessed with the definition of uh, reality. So uh, uh, Giorgio de Chirico, who was not a surrealist, he was uh, before them and he was a great adver adversary of the surrealists uh, all his life. Uh, he was, he was a, a, um, a painter who uh, had not only imagination, but had a fantasy, had fantasy. Uh, his uh, metaphors, uh, painting metaphors uh, are deep, are deep. They uh, uh, strike us as uh, absolutely strange and beyond, uh, beyond everything we can experience. Uh, that metaphysical painting uh, where uh, um, it's always uh, at noon, uh, no people uh, in the streets, the arcades that repeat all, all the time, the um, um, statues, uh, mutilated statues, uh, the mannequins and so on, they create a world which strike us very powerfully which is not of this uh, world. Uh, they, uh, they, they tell us something, some story from other universes, from a parallel way of, uh, of, uh, of um, living things and so on. So I think uh, this is uh, the distinction. Um, um, a secondhand writer, when he wants to write uh, um, fantastic literature, because we we are talking about this, uh, makes uh, um, an, uh, an oyster play the accordion, for example. <laughs> so makes a, um, a, an image of, of a certain, uh, certain kind. But someone who, is, who knows what, what he or she does uh, makes some character who one day wakes up by becoming a bug by becoming a big bug who is forced to live the life of a bug. So uh, he loses um, every, um, every um, senses uh, um, that we have and he gets some other senses. Uh, there was that uh, essay, uh, uh, how is like to be a bat? How how uh, Nigel. yes Nigel mm -hmm. how how uh, a bat perceives life uh, and uh, this is Kafka Kafka was not human uh, up to up to some age up to up to the the, the night when he wrote the verdict he was a, a, a normal writer uh, nothing special about him but after he wrote the verdict he changed changed into something super superhuman. He became a super writer, in my uh, in my opinion, just because he was he he gave up uh, being a writer. When he gave gave up being a writer, he became something more than a writer, because he let his mind free. This is I think this is the way uh, for each and every writer to to do wonderful things to let your mind free. It's like uh, like uh, the right at the races. Uh, when um, you are riding, well, uh, there's that uh, very little uh, person, very small person, very light person who rides a horse, the, the, the jockey, who has to be very, very small because uh, the horse is uh, winning the, uh, the race, is not, not the, the jockey. So the jockey has to, a good jockey, a wonderful jockey, has to leave his horse win the race without touching it, without um, uh, using the cravash, without uh, using the, I don't know how, how you call them, the uh, hot spurs, I don't know. Yes, uh, the, sp the spur, yeah. Uh, so um, an ideal jockey uh, should levitate over the horse without touching it in any point. And in this way, the horse, which is our mind, and the jockey is, is our ego, uh, the horse could be free and win the race, get to the photo.
and reminded, and um, this might be a spoiler alert for some of you who haven't gotten to this part, but the narrator uh, turns into a mite. And when I read that part, I was at home and I said, I was telling my family like, he turned into a mite. Has, has any character ever turned into a mite? And my oldest was like, well, yeah, uh, in, in Kafka. So <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> but there is that when the narrator turns into a mite, there is that sort of, that those passages are, are a deep imagining of what is it like being a mite? And the mite goes through a number of transformations and is eaten. It it you know it it feels like okay now it is a mite, um, and and you follow the co the imaginative consequences of somebody turning into a mite, being a mite. What is it like to be a mite? Yes, uh, in in my book uh, there wasn't uh, the question what is like to be a mite. Uh, this was a secondary uh, thing. The question was, was it like to get in in uh, some someone else's universe? Uh, what is like to try to communicate to some somebody else? Um, be it a mite, uh, be it uh, be be him a person uh, uh, or whatever. Uh, so it's about communication, the possibility of transmitting the. Um, an annunciation, the good uh, news uh, in a religious uh, way to some uh, barbarian population, let's say. So uh, that might, uh, in which uh, my character turns, is a sort of a Jesus Christ of the mites. So he, <laughs> he comes from our world, our human world, to give the annunciation, the good news of um, redemption to the uh, to a population of mites and uh, i started um, this thing this chapter uh, this idea with something that really happened to me so uh, one night i felt a very uh, a very unpleasant sting here between my uh, my two fingers and uh, in the morning when i woke up I had a cicatrice here. I had a, 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 a sort of a little wound, a tiny wound with two points of, uh, of uh, piercing the, the, the skin. And uh, um, because of that, I imagined that one of my characters, um, uh, um, it's like in the laboratory cultivated uh, population of mites on his own skin. Uh, yes, because it was a, um, um, a, um, a physician who studied mites, a biologist who studied mites, and he cultivated a population of mites on his own uh, skin. And uh, after that, he sent through, um, I don't know what uh, science fiction uh, device, uh, <laughs> which I invented on the spot, he sent um, his disciple in the world of those mites to, to try to make them um, aware of the fact that there is another world, uh, let alone their own provincial uh, and autarchic uh, world that they knew. And uh, to make they understand that uh, some, some other creatures can think more exist more, um, believe more, know more about the universe, about another universe than they do. So this character gets into their uh, uh, world, like in the Bible, Jesus came down in, um, in the little Jewish, small Jewish uh, world to bring them this news that they are not alone. They are uh, very, very small, actually. They are not... Uh, the most important uh, beings in the universe. So it's a parable. It's a parable. Uh, this character gets in their world and tries to spread the word. Uh, but uh, uh, it happens like in the Bible, uh, that character is actually crucified. He is crucified. He cannot 
he cannot, cannot spread the word because there is incommunication between us and the mites. Um, if we want to, to bring them um, uh, to, to um, our world, uh, it will be impossible because they have other senses, other kinds of senses, other language, other habits. Everything is different from our world. So the, the real communication between the levels or among the levels of existence is not possible. It's like uh, we, we cannot really understand how the, um, um, let's say, uh, the quarks um, make up the protons or the neutrons in, in a nucleus of, of an atom. It's uh, almost impossible to understand the concepts of the quantum physics. Um, they are like poetry. They are met metaphorical in a way. Um, they can only be, be described by um, mathematics, but not by common sense. We cannot understand what happens there. Uh, a, a proton um, has, a, has its own weight, but its own weight, its, own, it's 10 times, no, it's 100 times uh, bigger than uh, the weight of the three quarks that uh, uh, make up the, the proton. So where is the 99% of its, uh, its uh, heaviness? It's only from energy. It's only from the energy of the gluons and the quarks and so on. So uh, we cannot understand this with our minds. We are too weak to understand this. It's, it's a, a, a completely different world. And the same, we cannot understand the, the black holes, for example. Uh, maybe in each black hole, whole, uh, there's a new universe, that there's a whole baby universe, let's say. We cannot tell, we cannot understand. Something you said um, brought to mind um, what I wrote down as the, the myth, misfits of the imagination that are in solenoid. There are so many characters, like many of them real, that have existed that seem to want to communicate with other worlds um, there is Hinton in the fourth dimension. Um, and then there's Alice Boone, who imagines this sort of complex cues. Uh, and then there's, I forget his name, the, um, the master of dreams, that Mosquite. Um, and then there's the other one who uh, would do the self hangings to see. So all of those sort of misfits in a way are relate to what you were saying, this sort of uh, impulse of wanting to know more, seeing if there's anything else out there. Um, well, um, yes, this is the second um, um, floor, let's say, or the second step like in rockets, you know, of my, of my book. Uh, the first one was the soil in a way from which uh, everything grew. Um, it was called uh, my, anom uh, my anomalies, as you said, because uh, uh, during my life, uh, I, uh, I um, had uh, lots of, uh, well, psychological, let's say, uh, anomalies that uh, few people have, uh, starting from all kinds of visions, uh, st starting from all kinds of uh, seiz seizures, um, um, from uh, what I called visitors uh, before I knew that uh, uh, Whitley uh, Strip, Strip, Striber is, isn't his name, um, had also been in a sort of a science fiction uh, work, uh, also visitors. So um, uh, night by night uh, for seven or eight years, uh, I, I, I think, I, I was visited by someone. Uh, it was real. It was absolutely real. I opened the eyes, uh, my eyes, uh, in the middle of the night, and I saw someone staying on my bed, sitting, uh, sitting on my bed. Um, I can draw each and every person that I saw. Uh, they resisted about um, seven, eight seconds, and they vanished away after that. And each and every night it happened that. Uh, even now, I don't, don't 
don't uh, understand what uh, what happened with my mind by that time. This was a, a sort of an anomaly, as I call them, and there were many others. Uh, so, uh, um, in the first part of uh, my book, I tried to create this soil of uh, strange, uh, um, um, unbelievable uh, um, things that happened to my character, who actually was a very humble uh, uh, high school teacher. And uh, from this soil grew the stem of my, uh, of my novel, uh, which has a point uh, of no return at, at, the, at, at its very middle. And it's the most important uh, scene uh, in the whole book. It's a, um, a sort of an ethical dilemma, an ethical parable. Uh, it's the house on fire. Uh, it's the most important thing in my in my whole book because uh, it's uh, the point where my character takes a, an absolute decision, takes a decision, decision which is a moral one, and the, which will influence the development of the of the book uh, from that point on. So you have a house on on fire, and inside there are two things. There's a baby, a, a very young baby. Uh, a newborn baby uh, crying there and uh, moving uh, its, uh, its um, uh, limbs and uh, a masterpiece of, of, a, a, of a, a painting um, like a Vermeer or uh, like a Rembrandt uh, or like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, um, uh, like um, uh, one of Da Vinci's uh, um, uh, paintings. And you can save only one thing from the house which is burning. Which will you save? And uh, when I started to, to write this page, I really did not know the answer. I really did not know the answer. And to my uh, astonishment, because my literature was pure aesthetic uh, till uh, then, my character had no um, hesitation. He chose the baby. He chose the baby. And uh, um, his, uh, his lover, uh, who was also a professor of uh, physics uh, in, the same, uh, in the same school, uh, uh, became a sort of an advocate of the devil. And she said, but uh, if you knew that this baby will become a serial murderer, what would you do? And my character said, I would also save the baby. But if, if this baby will become Adolf Hitler himself, I will also save the baby. This is very important for my book because it, it's, it's a mirror of other two um, literary situations of this kind. First, uh, you can find in um, Dostoevsky's Karamazov Brothers, where um, the problem is, it's, it's the, the, the chapter of the big inquisitor, uh, where the problem is why uh, uh, have a, an innocence to suffer? Uh, why do the innocences, innocence people suffer? And uh, mostly the, the example that Dostoevsky gave there was the innocent child. Why can God allow an innocent child be murdered, be, um, um, I don't know, uh, be uh, uh, mutilated and so on, which happens uh, all the time in the world. And uh, the second one, which developed on the first, is the situation in Thomas Mann's uh, um, um, The Enchanted uh, Mountain, Magic Mountain, the, the Magic Mountain where uh, uh, Hans Kastorp, uh, the, the main character, is uh, in a sanatorium in the mountains. And one day he um, goes uh, in the snow, uh, he um, goes skiing, skiing in the snow. Uh, but uh, the, the cold becomes very, very hard and uh, he is about to die of cold. And he uh, falls asleep in the snow and has this a uh, very strange dream. So he dreams of a temple, a temple of happy people, 
um, in the temple, the, the, the people who stayed there were led a, a paradise-like uh, life. But under the, uh, under the temple, a child was killed each year. It's a, it was a sacrifice for the people outside being happy. So would you allow a child sacrificed? Uh, um, so would you allow uh, the, the general happiness with the, uh, um, based on the, sacri the sacrifice of, of a child? It's the same in, uh, in my novel, which is the answer in a way. You always should choose the child. Uh, it doesn't matter what uh, else is on the other on the other side. It doesn't matter if um, uh, there's a masterpiece. Masterpieces w uh, always were and will always be. But a child is unique, and uh, a child never has to become Adolf Hitler. Um, the child has no um, fixed future. The future is fluctuating. Uh, if you if if somebody really really loved. Adolf Hitler, maybe he wouldn't become uh, what he became. If um, he was allowed in the um, uh, um, um, Academy of Arts, you know, uh, uh, Hitler will be, uh, would have become uh, um, a bad uh, painter. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so on. So uh, uh, my hero chooses uh, life, chooses life and not the art, not uh, the craftsmanship, not uh, excellence. He chooses the basic life, which is the child. And after that, I, 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 I tried to um, see how my character's uh, future is influenced by this, uh, this uh, uh, by what he chose uh, um, <clears throat> at a certain moment. And for this, I invented this uh, machinery I would say this narrative machinery uh, built around uh, a, a Gnostic idea. Um, so the Gnostics, you know, uh, it was a movement in the first and second century after after Christ, after Jesus, um, and a sort of a reinterpretation of uh, of uh, Christianity. So um, the Gnostics uh, said that they were not from here they came from above they uh, their real uh, fatherland was in the skies so uh, for them uh, uh, jehovah was a bad uh, um, god and they uh, believed in yaldabaoth who was above uh, being and not being the real god so um, they thought that in this world they were imprisoned so they had to escape the the main uh, um, the main uh, thing that a, a real gnostic uh, should do was to escape their body and to escape the world. So uh, I imagined that uh, this uh, soma sema, as they said, uh, the body is a prison. Uh, actually, uh, for each one living in this world, there is not not only one prison. So uh, the soma, the body, is not the only prison. It's the second prison. Our first prison, prison is our mind, our brain. Our second prison is our body. And our final prison is the world itself, the, the, the universe itself. So how can you escape? How can you escape? Because you have a concentric infinite prison. And there is an answer. And uh, this mechanism that I built is, was uh, uh, made to uh, make the escape uh, available. And how can you escape from this universe? Evading in the fourth direction. It's, it's an analogy. If you were living in a, in a, on a page, for example, in two dimensions, the escape was to raise perpendicularly to the page. Uh, because if you ran in, in, in your world, uh, which, which was two dimensional, you would never escape because the page is infinite. So you should find a way to raise perpendicularly and to evade in, the, in our three dimensions. And it's the same with us. We can only evade 
escape from this world, raising perpendicularly on this world in the fourth dimension. And my, my uh, book is about this fourth, fourth dimension that all the mystics uh, dreamed about. And uh, this is why uh, one of my characters uh, is Charles Hinton, who, is, um, who, who was uh, the, I don't know, the, the one who was uh, mostly obsessed with the uh, fourth dimension. He wrote uh, a treatise about uh, the fourth dimension. He invented a kit of cubes, colored cubes, um, where uh, you could uh, try to visualize the fourth dimension, which is very, very hard. You know, uh, in topology exist uh, objects um, created uh, in, the four, in four dimensions, but it's very hard to vis visualize them in three dimensions. So uh, Hinton became one of my characters. He, Hinton was good friends with Lewis Carroll and with Abbott who wrote about uh, life in two dimensions and so on. And um, when, um, writing about Hinton, I immediately observed that actually he was not alone. He was in a constellation of uh, people who wanted to escape this world. So he married one of the daughters, the five daughters, all of them were geniuses. All the five daughters uh, were geniuses of, uh, of uh, George Bull, the famous uh, mathematician and log logician. Uh, in, uh, in Britain, and uh, he cheated uh, this uh, woman with uh, another sister uh, of, of Bull, so it was a scandal in Bull's family. But what is uh, extraordinarily interesting is that uh, one of uh, the um, Bull's daughters, which was, uh, who was called um, uh, Ethel Lillian Bull, uh, became a very well-known writer. And she wrote a, a book called, called The Godfly, uh, God, um, sorry, Godfly, yeah. The Godfly, uh, which was very, very uh, um, um, successful, mostly in the USSR, because uh, um, she was a revolutionary woman and she was, uh, uh, famous by that time, not as a writer, but as a revolutionary. So the, uh, the Soviet Union uh, praised her very much. So uh, the Godfly uh, sold in millions of copies in uh, the USSR. And Yuri Gagarin, when flew to, to around, the, uh, around the, the earth, had a, a copy of the Godfly with him in the cabin of, uh, of the rocket. So. Uh, um, by, at that moment, I remembered that the book which impressed me the most in my childhood was The Godfly. And so the, the uh, constellation started to, uh, to appear. And I was amazed when I heard that Ethel Lillian Voynich, uh, Ethel Lillian Bull, was not only the author of The Godfly, the book which uh, made me. Uh, cry uh, my, my eyes out uh, when I read it, but she was also married after that with uh, uh, a book uh, collector uh, called Voynich, a Polish uh, one, who uh, owned at a certain moment the Voynich manuscript, which obsessed me all the time for 10 years or for 20 years because it it's the only uh, manuscript that resisted any um, uh, translation, translation uh, any, any un understanding. So uh, I thought that everything uh, was connected. Everything was connected. It was like a rose of, uh, of uh, connections. And uh, to this rows of connections, which made um, a sort of a rosette like in cathedrals uh, in, my, in my book, I added some picturesque uh, characters, as you mentioned, people who um, went beyond the um, uh, human possibilities. For example, uh, Nikolai Vaskide, who was a Romanian uh, uh, psychoanalyst who um, published uh, 
two years after Freud's uh, um, interpretation of dreams in 1901, he published in 1903 um, his own book uh, where he tried to interpret uh, dreams. And another one was uh, also Nikolai, Nikolai um, Minovich, who um, uh, wanted to become champion at uh, controlled hanging, self-hanging. So in his laboratory, he hanged himself thousands of times, trying to um, uh, make a record, to, to break the records of uh, controlled hanging and to become the world champion. And uh, uh, during his uh, periods of when he was hanged um, uh, with a special tool, a special uh, uh, train, um, uh, made in his laboratory, he had visions. He had fantastic visions, like being um, um, under LSD or something like that. And uh, I, it was very nice for me to describe his visions. <laughs> so everything went more and more uh, in a kind of fantastic uh, um, archaeology of mind, in a way till the final uh, um, development when, um, but it's very complicated. I, I cannot retell everything. Uh, at the end, uh, it's a sort of a, the end of the world where Bucharest raises like a UFO, leaving a, a, a big uh, uh, pit under it, which is like the entrance in the hell, actually. It's full of demons. And Bucharest goes uh, in the clouds and vanishes uh, in the air. Um, so uh, um, with, uh, with, uh, with very few details, this is a story of, of my, uh, my uh, character who, um, and I, I will add only one other thing. Uh, uh, he, all his life, he wanted to, to become a writer, but he couldn't. Uh, so he um, resigned uh, to uh, resignated to write for himself, only for himself, and he wrote actually the book which is in our hands, uh, Solenoid, um, and he never showed it to uh, to anyone. And he tried to uh, save himself from the world, as we said, um, by means of a huge goddess of obsidian, uh, 20 meters high, uh, the goddess of desperation, of despair. Uh, but when he could do this, he, uh, he didn't want to. He, uh, he refused um, to save himself because in the meantime, he uh, had a family, he had a daughter and he chose to stay with, with humanity, to stay with the people. He chose to, uh, to choose love and not self, uh, uh, selfish uh, uh, evasion from, from the world. So um, in the famous Camus dilemma, solitaire, solidaire, he chose to be solidaire. Uh, uh, he chose solidarity with the whole uh, humanity. So um, are we, yes, so um, the final thing I'll say is, uh, thank you for that, by the way, that was, for those who haven't uh, read Solenoid, um, this is my experience. I read the first 350 pages in Spanish, and then I thought that I knew what the book was about. Uh, and I said, okay, I'm going to save the rest for, you know, a rainy day. And then when I actually got to reading what came next, I was like, I did not see that coming. So this, the, the book changes, like you were saying, the, the first step. Uh, and then there is this world that it's uh, created to seek for other worlds that happens that changes the book quite a bit uh, and, and makes it a remarkable, remarkable novel. Um, so we'll open up the floor here and then we'll go to the to those online on the questions. Questions here uh, in San Francisco. 
talked a lot about uh, trees um, and how like surreal um, films can look. There's also these incredible descriptions of kind of regular life of teaching and the mundanity of teaching. Um, and you combine them really uh, excellently. And so I was kind of curious if you felt there was sort of a difference in or of writing between and kind of combining and how you sort of mix them so elegantly. Uh, yeah, uh, we come, uh, thank you for uh, your question. We come to the um, um, topic of um, uh, what's the difference uh, between uh, being a realist, a realist writer, a realistic writer and a fantastic writer. Uh, the difference is not so big. It's not so big. This is a, a sort of a secret that a few people who write um, fantastic literature, science fiction, things like that, uh, no. Uh, you have to, the secret is that you have to make uh, the reader believe you. Uh, if uh, the reader cannot uh, believe you, uh, uh, she or he will throw the book away or let it for uh, a rainy day. <laughs> uh, so, so even the most, uh, um, the author most committed to fantastic literature like Cortázar was in many of his uh, stories. Uh, I, I love uh, his stories. I don't like uh, too much his novels. Um, except uh, parts from Rayuela. Um, but uh, um, uh, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, a writer of fantastic literature should know is that he should be, uh, he should, he, he uh, should uh, be able to write um, in the very, uh, in the extreme, in an extremely realistic way, first, uh, it's like um, like a plane that he has to um, to 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 go on the tarmac um, um, a very long way be, be, uh, before taking off, uh, and the the more he uh, rolls on this uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, way, uh, I don't know how what's the word in English. Uh, the the higher he he it uh, the higher it flies. So um, um, this is why I I praise uh, the um, uh, authors of fantastic literature who can write the most realistic pages, like Balzac or like uh, um, I don't know like Flaubert. Uh, so uh, you have to be realistic. You have to know how to draw a hand before uh, becoming uh, a cubist or a uh, uh, surrealist and so, and so on. So I would say that uh, realism and um, uh, the fantastic are on the two sides of a Möbius uh, stripe. Um, they, uh, uh, you, you, you can never tell where one ends and uh, where the other begins because it's the same. It's, uh, everything is it's the same. Um, we think we uh, we uh, um, live in uh, in some way uh, when we are uh, um, awake and lead our uh, usual life on the in the streets and uh, um, so on, uh, and we live in some other way uh, at night when we have uh, uh, our uh, inner uh, inner life. But actually. Uh, in, in our life, there's no difference between them. We dream, then we live our uh, common dream, which is reality. Uh, and then we dream our uh, um, own dreams uh, that, uh, that are uh, our nocturnal life. And then we awake again. So uh, nature does no difference uh, between the state of uh, um, uh, um, uh, an imaginary life and uh, the state of a real uh, uh, life. So uh, I think that a writer who wants to uh, become more than realistic, he has to uh, know what realism is in, in literature. I wanted to add real quick that uh, when I finish the novel, 
which ends with Bucharest kind of floating. I went, I started again right away, and I did notice how at the beginning you're planting the seeds with the solenoids, like they're described very like, okay, here it is, they're underneath. Oh, it doesn't really work. There's a lot of realism and description of these solenoids underneath uh, the house that he ends up buying. Yes, uh, even this uh, um, uh, very idea of a solenoid uh, came to me from, uh, well, I have many, many, uh, I'm a very curious person. I'm really very curious and I, I don't want to die before knowing everything that I can know about the world. Um, so I'm I'm uh, very much committed to to reading um, anything. I read um, I, maybe a quarter of what I read is literature, but I read science. I I read a lot of science. I just love to to be informed, not only informed but to be formated in a way by what I read uh, from um, I don't know um, embryology or. Um, uh, uh, entomology and uh, uh, quantum physics and philosophy and mysticism and everything. I think the 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 field of knowledge is continuous. It's a it's a, only one field of knowledge um, which we uh, put in different uh, uh, drawers uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, um, uh, I would say methodological reasons, mm -hmm. but. Um, Everything is uh, is continuous. Uh, it's a continuum uh, um, between uh, mathematics and uh, theology, between theology and philosophy, between philosophy and poetry. And in my opinion, poetry is the highest way uh, our mind works, the highest level uh, our mind knows. Uh, so uh, um, I think uh, that... Uh, Knowing, uh, trying to know uh, as much as you can is, uh, is uh, um, the only way of feeling yourself human, of feeling yourself, uh, um, um, of, 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 of uh, uh, fulfilling your, uh, your destiny as a human uh, person. Maybe we'll take some questions from uh, the online world. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, I uh, I feel myself a poet. I always uh, I always uh, uh, praised myself as a poet mainly, but not as a writer of poems. Uh, for me, poetry is much more than writing poems. Uh, writing poems uh, is uh, sometimes to be a, a poet, but most of, most of the time of not being a poet. Um, um, most of the books of poetry do not contain poetry um, uh, as compared to um, our day-by-day um, -day life, which is full of poetry. It, it drips poetry. Um, so uh, I only love the poets uh, who are able to make real poetry in their verses, but they are very few. Uh, for me, Rilke is the top of poetry ever. Um, and uh, very, very few uh, other poets uh, are, in my opinion, uh, really able to, to do poetry. But on the contrary, very humble and modest people that we um, meet every day can be real poets, can be real poets, can preserve uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, reservoir, that container, of poetry that we all had when we were children, because the 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 each and every children is a, a, a real poet. Um, in um, Saint Thomas' uh, uh, um, Gospel, uh, he said uh, that uh, uh, the old man will learn from the uh, little babies what the world is, and they will be happy. Uh, with uh, with what the little children say. Uh, so uh, if we are able to preserve our ingenuity, our um, 
oblique way to look at the things that we see um, uh, in the case of uh, the little children or uh, the autistic persons um, who do not look at this glass like that, but like that in, in, a, in, a, in an oblique, uh, unusual way, uh, when we notice that someone, which can be a simple uh, peasant, uh, farmer, or a simple uh, worker, can do this strange way of seeing things, uh, we, uh, we understand that she or he is a poet. Um, and uh, I had uh, in my life the opportunity of meeting absolutely wonderful poets who never wrote a verse in their life. Um, I love poetry. Uh, I think uh, poetry is uh, like that pyramidon that uh, was a small pyramid at the top of the real pyramids. Uh, so the, the summit, the paramount uh, art and the paramount uh, way of knowing, getting to know things. Uh, why do I say that? Because actually poetry is grace. Poetry is grace, it's the universal grace. So this grace we find not only in literature, not only in, uh, in uh, poetry, but in all the um, fields of knowledge. Uh, an equation can have grace. Uh, the, the mathematicians uh, can make the distinction between ugly equations, um, heavy equations, uh, unpleasant ones, and gracious ones. Um, the philosophy can be graceful or else can be very um, um, earthly. Let us compare Plato with Aristotle. Uh, Plato is a poet. He has always been a poet, a great poet. Um, everywhere in all the sciences, we find grace. Um, that old uh, and not very um, reliable uh, um, um, law of biology where they say the, the um, ontogeny, ontogeny repeats the phylogeny. So um, during the stages of the embryo, uh, the embryo repeats all the stages of the, of the species, um, being at first like a um, uh, sea um, um, uh, creature, like a fish, like a frog, like a, like a ma mammal and so on, till it becomes a uh, human. In my opinion, this is great poetry. And I think we all are living in a huge poem which wrote itself or was written by some other person bigger than us as we are bigger than the mites. Uh, it doesn't matter for me if uh, the world made itself, created itself or was created. It really doesn't matter for me, but we live in this huge poem. And in this huge poem, we are all in a way poets. Well, I thank uh, this person. Um, yes, it was a prize that I got uh, yesterday in Romania, uh, a nice prize. I love some prizes and I hate some other ones. Uh, <laughs> when a, a prize is a real one, when it's given to you, by uh, um, um, by a reliable jury, uh, not because of uh, some literary politics or cultural politics, but because they appreciate what you do uh, without knowing you, without uh, uh, knowing um, what's your uh, what's your uh, um, gender or what's your uh, um, uh, race or what's your uh, uh, I don't know any other uh, feature. Uh, I love to be to get a prize from them, but if they are the other way around, I hate it. And uh, it happened to me to refuse prizes when I uh, I I wasn't sure uh, about uh, their uh, reliability and decency. 
-hmm. And then we have one other question. What works of art do you believe that you can do? Substantial uh, uh, questions. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, making art, uh, like making everything else, um, being a scientist or an artist or anything, is to sacrifice your life. Uh, because in the period when you write, and I hope you will agree, uh, when you write, you, you cannot leave. Uh, when you write, you are a slave of your literature, of your uh, uh, vocation. Uh, writing means losing your life. This is the sad truth about each and every um, real vocation, real uh, um, uh, obsession in your life. If you are obsessed with something, uh, you lose the life of um, uh, everybody's life. You lose the, uh, your life like uh, every man. Um, so uh, for 40 years, um, I lived only for literature. Um, with a Romanian saying, I ate literature on bread uh, each and every day. Uh, so I was very happy. happy the happiness uh, had only one meaning for me, to be able to write a page that I could like, that I can like. But um, when I grew older and wiser, I hope, I hope so, uh, I understood the value of life. I understood much more this immense gift that was made to us, to all of us. I understood that I cheated in a way um, whoever gave us this gift. Uh, I thought that uh, um, in, uh, in a big part, my life was uh, wasted. Um, I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm not very proud of what I, what I did during uh, this, uh, these uh, 40 or 50 years because I have no, uh, no merit in it. I was, as I told you, in a way, I, I was only a portal. A portal. I was only like a prophet who doesn't speak uh, his uh, own own words, but somebody else's, somebody big, somebody bigger and uh, uh, much wiser person who was speaking uh, through through my voice. Um, um, so I'm not proud of what I did, but I'm very proud of everything I loved in this life, of and I still love. I'm very proud of my family. I'm, I'm really very proud of uh, breathing air, of uh, um, being with my friends, of um, watching movies, and uh, of uh, doing uh, what each and every person does. Um, only after I was 60, I, um, I learned how to enjoy life. I think we, we don't have time for more questions so here in the room. If anybody has any questions, if you have one question in the back. I couldn't hear. So if if I am um, going to repeat the question for the for uh, online and then for the rest. So 
you're asking about the disparity between the reality and and its one level of reality being um, difficult and challenging for uh, the narrator, but also inhabiting these other um, imaginative war worlds and hallucinations. Is that the core of the question? Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm. I'm getting to your. Okay, now I see. Now I see, and I thank you for this uh, very, very nice question. Yes, uh, suffering is also a, a part of life. Uh, we have to, uh, we have to live, uh, and I think it's more than that. Um, suffering is uh, the, in my opinion, and not only, of course, in I'm not at all original in this. Uh, suffering is uh, the real definition of. Uh, of uh, uh, of reality, um, for something to be real for us, um, it must hurt us. Um, it uh, has to touch our skin, to touch our eyes, to make them hurt, um, to make them uh, 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 create uh, that electricity that after that runs through our brain and gets to our uh, organs uh, of uh, feeling pain, feeling fear, fe feeling anxiety, and so on. So um, it is true for, and it's, I have this definition even in this, uh, in this solenoid, in this novel, uh, it is true that uh, reality is, is feeling pain, is being hurt. Um, Let's take a, a picture, a picture on the wall. If it doesn't strike you, I, I've been uh, this, this morning to the MoMA uh, here, and uh, many uh, paintings that hang on, on the walls didn't tell me too much. So they disappeared uh, in a minute from my mind. But uh, those ones who hurt me, who um, aggressed me in a way, who made me uh, suffer in front of them, um, were those uh, uh, who will never disappear in, in, uh, in my mind. Um, there's a splendid novel uh, um, written by Sabato, by Ernesto Sabato, The Tunnel, where uh, um, a woman character sees a painting in a museum, and she's immediately, um, instantly struck by that painting. She feels that the, the, the one who, who made the painting, the painter, understood her even more than she understands herself. And uh, this is the way she meets uh, the main character in, uh, in, in that novel. So uh, uh, everything happens around us is unreal if it doesn't hurt you, in my opinion. This can be a, a good definition of reality and of life. Um, it doesn't mean that uh, hurting you means uh, uh, making uh, scars, making uh, wounds. It's enough to, it's enough a photon touch your retina. This means hurting it. This means impressing it. This means uh, uh, letting you not indifferent. And this is life. This is reality. Wittgenstein has a very nice uh, approach uh, uh, on it when saying, uh, well, uh, um, the people say that, for example, this floor is not uh, real. Uh, because uh, actually it's made uh, of atoms and atoms means vacuum space. Um, most of the um, um, atom is, uh, is void. So the floor cannot be uh, real. But, says uh, Wittgenstein, actually we learned what reality is being shown the floor as it is. So the floor... Uh, 
supports not only us, our heavy bodies, but supports the idea of real reality. With that, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn over to Peter. Now, I would like to say some words before, if possible. Sorry, Peter. Uh, actually, I wanted to thank you first for uh, the wonderful presentation you did uh, uh, at first, at the beginning of our uh, discussion. And uh, of course, I want to thank Mauro very much for uh, for, for being so kind to, to be with me and to, to, to talk with me in this evening. And also, of course, I want to thank you all, all of you uh, because you sacrificed some other very pleasant things that you could do. <laughs> and to come here to suffer with us and to create, <laughs> to create reality with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.